right, so um, we're going to read around again. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. If you're not comfortable reading, just tap the person next to you, and they'll just keep on going. Um, so Revelation chapter 3, and verses 1 to 6, and we'll just take a couple of verses each. And Mom, you get to start. Actually, we'll start with uh, the back row there, and then we'll come up to the front, and I'll just make it a little bit more logical. Just three of them, so you don't have to read this first time. Three verses one to six. And unto the angel of the ecclesia of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God in the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. But or be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are already that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not found their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So we're looking at Sardis. This is the second class, and I left on the board behind me um, what we looked at last week, what we ended off with last week, and it was really the conundrum that kind of comes to us between the two um, sections of thought, I guess you could say. They're both biblical principles, but they're principles that have to be um, kind of held together. And so the one of them, we were looking at the passage in Revelation 3, um, verse 4, there are a few, there has a few there that have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And we were just looking at the concept and the idea that, well, if they're in the ecclesia, are they not already clothed with a garment? And are they saved, quote unquote? Um, or how exactly does that work? And we were kind of com looking at two <laughs> concepts. Um, one was from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. I think we'll just read that. We'll just read these two passages one more time, just to kind of bring this into our mind. So, Mom, if you want to read Ephesians 2, and uh, verses 8 to 10, and then we'll go into James, and we'll take a look at James. And we'll just kind of refresh our memories on what we were talking about last week. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So that was the first concept, right? It's by grace we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, lest anybody should boast, right? Not of works, lest anybody should boast. It's the gift of God, right? So the second sort of seemingly contradictory passage to this comes up in James, and it's James chapter 2, and we want to read verse 14, and then verses 17 and 18. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say ye have faith, and have not works, can faith save him? Even so, faith, is, if it hath not works, is dead alone. 18. So? Yeah, down to 18. Wait, what did you say before? 17 and 18. Okay. Uh, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Ye man say, thou hast faith and have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith with my by my works. Okay, so there's the second sort of seemingly contradictory concept, is that faith... Um, is got to be accomplished with works. You can't have faith alone and have it save you. And then he ends up with verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Um, it, it's alone, right? So, so those seemingly are contradictory. 
Paul says it's by grace that you save through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. James says that faith without works is dead. So without works, it's not going to save you. And so we're sort of saying, well, exactly how does this work when you come to Revelation 3? Because you've got people here who it says they're worthy. Um, and how is it that they're worthy? Is it by grace that they're saved through faith? Or is it through works? Um, how exactly does that whole concept work? I find the last little phrase there helpful. Genesis uh, kind of picks up on this. But, or Sorry, James 2.26 as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is, is dead also, being alone. And if you remember, back in Genesis chapter 3, or chapter 2 actually, um, it talked about the idea that um, the way, well, let's just look at it. It's the creation of man. So Genesis chapter 2. And, um, and this makes sense on a, on a first principles level, um, because you have this concept of, of creation, and God creates man, and I'll just write it on the board here, so we'll have to add this in afterwards, Nathan. Um, so it's Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And he gives us the formula for life there, right? So Genesis 2 verse 7, God forms man out of the dust of the ground, breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and he becomes a living soul. So the formula for life, you have a body... It's formed out of the ground. Added to that is the breath of life, or breath, we're just going to call it. And what you get is a living soul. That's the formula for a living soul. And that goes totally contrary to what most people in most religions think of a, a soul, right? Because they'll tell you that the soul is something that floats off, that it's not actually connected to the body. But the Bible tells you, well, actually a living soul is the result of a body, plus you have then this breath of life. That's what constitutes a living soul. If you remove either of those elements, you don't have a living soul anymore, yes. according to this biblical, you know, sort of very fundamental definition. So if you take away the breath, then all you have is a corpse. You don't have a living soul. If you take away the corpse, you still don't have a living soul because you've got nothing for that breath to operate on. Now, that, now we understand that on a, on a first principle level, but the same thing is true when it comes to this concept we're trying to reconcile here. By grace you say through faith, none of yourselves it's the gift of God, but faith without works of dead is dead being alone because it's like the body without the spirit that's dead. Right? It's, you can't just say, I have this, this faith, if it's not resident in something, if it's not operating in something. So that's kind of the, the two things that are pulled together. So I just want to take a shot, aren't you? And then we'll laugh. Uh, so we want to kind of follow this concept through. Now, Brother Thomas in, in Eureka um, spends a fair amount of time dealing with this concept. So I thought, well, it's probably worthwhile having a look at, because it is one that is generally misunderstood, especially in the churches around. In fact, um, when I first met Terry and Lori um, and their parents, uh, they were following a guy named Dr. Eugene Scott. And I watched several of the videos um, that Scott, uh, um, of the, the classes that he gave, actually. And um, he, was a, he was a pretty uh, down-to-earth kind of preacher, um, shot from the hip. Uh, wore a big Stetson, smoked a stogie right on stage, or stogie or whatever they call him. And uh, he, uh, he was kind of an interesting fella. But he really had a, a, um, an issue with this concept of James versus Paul. Mm -hmm. And he, he spent hours trying to reconcile this. And, and pretty much his conclusion was James kind of was a bit of a loser and had it wrong. Paul had it right, um, but James was off base. Now, to, of course, us, we would argue, well, whatever happened to um, uh, the concept of inspiration of the scriptures? Because the Bible is inspired. Peter tells us, you know, or well, it comes up, Timothy and Peter, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So James can't be not uh, right and Paul right. It's just our understanding of what they had to say. So, Brother Thomas, in this section on Sardis, and I apologize that I didn't write down the, the page number on this, but he, he turns around and he says, belief of the gospel and the kingdom of God and immersion 
while they are indispensable to worthiness, do not alone constitute men worthy. So just because you believe and you get baptized doesn't mean that you become part of this group in, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4 that is called worthy. So the idea of once saved, always saved doesn't really work, right? It doesn't really um, come through in the scriptures. So we're going to take a look at a series of, of um, passages to do with this concept and, and sort of follow it through. Because it really, although when I first read this in, in Eureka, I was kind of thinking like it's a bit sort of um, out there in the sense of its connection. It does make a lot of sense. So the first passage we want to look at is um, Isaiah 40 or 64 and verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. And this is talking about, we're still, Revelation 3 and verse 4, right? This is what we're looking at. The idea of not having our garments polluted, right? So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. And this is kind of giving us, if you want to call it the default setting, this is where we all begin, right? So Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. I'm not sure where we got up to. Um, but whoever it was, if you'd like to read that. 64 and 6, just the one verse? Just the one verse. Okay. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness, righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Okay, so it's just one verse. But it's pretty powerful. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? So our righteousness <coughs> Oops, got the rest of the word. Get a little carried away here. Our righteousness equals filthy <coughs> rags. So if you think you're something, um, you're not, right? And that's the same with every single one of us, right? And this is Paul's comment over and over, that him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Which one of those are yours? That's mine? Okay, good. All right, so our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Why? Well, the answer comes up in Psalm 106, and let's read verse 34 to 39. They did not destroy the nations as the Lord had commanded them to. They mixed in with the nations and learned their ways. And they served the idols which were a snare to them. Yeah, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters or to apples. And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and went to whoring with their own invention. So do you pick up out of this section what was the defiling influence here? It was their own works. Right? And that's usually what it is with us. They were defiled with their own works. Right? So this was what was working upon us. When we talk about our righteousnesses as being as filthy rags, the reason, part of the reason is, is because we're constantly defiled with our own works. Our own actions are what defile us. Right? It's what we do that ends up uh, getting us into trouble. In fact, um, if you just want to flip over to Jude, um, just before Revelation, he makes a little comment there about um, people that are going astray and exhorts them to try and help them out, right? But some, yeah, let's read uh, Jude verses 22 to 23. I'm just going to put it as a cross reference here. Jude 22 to 23. And of some have compassion. Making a difference, 
on the other side with prayer, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So here you have the same idea, defiled with our own works. Jude calls it the garments that are spotted by the flesh. So it's an analogy that's being used, right? It's, it's using a word picture like God does through the whole Bible. And he's talking about our clothes, and our clothes are being made dirty. What's making them dirty? It's by our own actions. And in the case of Jude, it says by, our, our, um, by the flesh, right? By the things that we do that we ought not to do. Right? So that's what's going on in this situation here. Now, there's another thing that can defile us as well. And if you come to Titus chapter 1, and it's verses 15 to 16, it gives you an idea of the other thing that can, uh, can defile us. Yeah, Titus verses 15, and Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Yep. Oh, uh, 15, 16, Titus chapter 1, verses 15, 16. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Okay, so here you have the idea, is we can be defiled because of our unbelief, right? So our unbelief, our lack of belief in God, can be a defiling influence on us. And he goes on to say our mind and our conscience is defiled. And, and this isn't talking about, you know, just people out in the world. This is talking about people in the in the ecclesial environment, in the congregation, that basically were not believing what was being taught to them. Because he says they profess they know God, but in works they deny him, right? So you begin to see these two things. So they profess belief. But in works, they deny. So there is a profession of belief that's going on, but the actions are betraying that profession of belief. Okay? So now when you look at that concept, you say, okay, so there's the, the word picture that's being painted, the idea of garments being um, defiled uh, by our actions and by our lack of belief, which, of course, the lack of belief um, leads to actions. So it's in works that we are we are defiled, and that's exactly what it says up here. We're defiled by our works. That's what he was talking about in, in the Psalms. And um, by works here, and here it's by works as well. And they're defiled, it says, in their mind. Because obviously belief or lack of it is going to lead to actions which are going to defile us. So when we look at this concept, um, and you say, okay, well, there's the, there's the picture, there's the word picture. Our, our garments are seen as sort of a show of what we are like as a person, right? And this is symbolic language. Um, they can be defiled. Come to Zechariah because here you have the picture of our nature being equated with our garments. So Zechariah chapter 3, and this is a symbolic vision. And it's a vision of Yahshua, right, who is the Savior. It's the name of Jesus in the Old Testament, right? And here we have Yahshua clothed with filthy garments. So we're going to read Zechariah chapter 3, and we want to read verse 3 and 4. Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4. Sorry, Zechariah chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4. <coughs> yes. Now Joshua's clothes were filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, 
Take away the filthy garments from him, and, set, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I'll clothe thee with chains of raiment. Okay, so in this case here, <coughs> getting ahead of myself again, um, you've got the picture of a filthy garment and the change of raiment takes place, right? So he shows up and he's got a filthy garment, but a change of raiment is going to take place. He says, I'm going to clothe you with a change of raiment. Well, that's something that all of us go through. When we come to God in our, in our present state, it's not good enough. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, right? So sometimes you hear songs, you know, just as I am, you know, the way I am, that's good enough kind of thing. Not, it doesn't work that way. God wants us to be more than that, right? I mean, even, even the U.S. Marines have be more than that. You know what I mean? Be all that you can be. Don't just stay the way you are. You want to you wanna work up to something here. And that's what God's looking for us, is to us to, to adopt his character. So when we come into Christ, just as there's a change of raiment that's going on here, which is symbolizing a change of nature, right? Immortality that's going to take place. The same is true of us when we get baptized. So come to, uh, we know this one very well, we're just putting into context, Galatians 3, verses 26 to 27. Fred, if you want to read that one for us. So this is the change that takes place at baptism. Need to get a new Bible, brother. No, <coughs> getting Latin. This one will ask me. Three and twenty-six. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And twenty-seven. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ yourselves with and Fred's translation there is a good one mm -hmm. baptism is the equivalent of being clothed with Christ right to have put on Christ the, the original Greek there it holds the idea of to put something on as a garment right mm -hmm. so you put on Christ as a garment so that then you don't stand before God as Jonathan Bowen. You stand before God as Jonathan Bowen clothed with Christ as a garment as the covering. Which, of course, takes us right the way back to Genesis. Adam and Eve made for themselves coats of fig leaves, which are not good enough, right? That didn't cut it. That didn't cut it with God. So what they ended up doing, or God did, was he made coats of skins and he clothed them. And that figured forward, pointed forward to the sacrifice of Christ and how that he would be the covering for us. So baptism is the way in which we are covered with Christ. So as sinners in the world at large, we come to trust in God and by belief we are convicted children by faith in Christ Jesus, right? We then obey that faith and commandment and are baptized, and consequently, we put on Christ as a garment. So we're our covering, our nakedness is covered. Because if we were to reign by ourselves, well, our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not good enough. But when we come to Christ, of course, we put him on as a covering. So then let's go to Ephesians 2, and we're going to read a section here. Uh, Ephesians 2, and it's going to be verses 1 to 10. So maybe Hannah and Josiah, if you want to split that up between you, read five verses each. Ephesians 2. So we're going to read verses 1 to 10 because this kind of like pulls this concept together for us. <coughs> and you have he quickened. You are dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, 
even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the age ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of the works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay. So notice here a couple of things. First of all, he says, your default setting, when you begun, you're dead in trespasses and sins, by nature the children of wrath. So that's how we start out. This is the idea of our righteousness is as filthy rags, right? However, we're together in Christ, right, to, to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then he makes the statement, by grace are you saved through faith. So James seems to score a point here. By grace, we are saved through faith. And then he, he cites the same reasoning that James does. Um, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. Right? So it's not works that this is taking place. So it seems to be here in Ephesians... Paul almost contradicts himself, you know, um, or sorry, Paul contradicts James again. It's by grace you say through faith, not of yourselves. It's it's this this gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But what we've got to realize is what the context Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> he's talking about where we come from, right? So he's talking about the sinner... You who were dead in trespasses and sins, has he quickened, right? So his context is sinners. So sinners, in this case, are saved by grace, through faith, not of works, as any man should boast. Right? So when you think about it, stepping into the waters of baptism, what have you actually done? I mean, it's, I suppose you could call it a work of faith, sort of maybe. But it's not really work. You know what I mean? Like it's just simply obedience, right? You're just <laughs> acting on a belief. But so the first thing I think just to sort of take away from this is that the summary is all of us are in a state of uncleanness, Clean. but sinners are saved by grace through faith. So we could say the Apostle Paul kind of scores in this one, and maybe James is uh, is out to lunch. So this is that passage we were looking at, and when you follow that reasoning through, it seems to make sense, right? That that Paul's right, and perhaps you know I'm not saying James is wrong, but at this point in time we got to kind of figure out what James is talking about. Um, but that that sort of is is a fair summary. Of, of what this argument is all about. So sinners are saved by grace through faith. Okay, that's the first kind of part of this. But come back to Revelation chapter 3, because we want to just look here at what he has to say um, in sort of reference to this. Because if this is true, how do we reconcile what we're reading about in the letter to Sardis? So Revelation chapter 3, and we read it together at the beginning. He writes there, and he says, look, you've got a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Right? So you look the part. You seem to be, you seem to have followed this whole process here. You seem to be in the truth. You've got a name that you're alive, but you're actually dead. How do you know that? Well, he says... I know your works, 
that thou hast a name that thou livest, and you're dead. So what are they judged on? What is the basis of, of whether they're alive or dead? It's actually based on their works, right? So that's a bit of a conundrum, really, because, you know, we've just gone through this whole idea of by grace are you saved through faith, um, not of yourselves, lest any should boast, not, or sorry, not of, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any should boast, but here he turns around and says, wait a minute, the reason I know that you're dead is because of your works, right? So it's because of their actions. So you then sort of have to say, well, how do you reconcile that? So on the one hand, sinners are saved by grace through faith. But on the other hand, he's saying that, well, Houston, we got a problem here because you've got a name that you're alive, but you're actually dead because of your works. So that's Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. And this is the, the, the mystery that we're trying to figure out. I'm going to use blue because black's <coughs> fading away on us here. So the, the way that you have a name that you live, but the point is, I know your works. And it's on that basis, he says, you have a name that you live, but you're dead. So the dead is a result of the works. Those two concepts basically <coughs> are being tied together, which seems to be contradictory to everything we just looked at, in Ephesians especially. Go on to read, he says, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain and are ready to die. Why? Because I've not found your works perfect. So the works, and that's the issue, are not perfect. And it's because of that that they are ready to die. So you have to ask the question, well, wait a minute. Were they not clothed or made white, so to speak, at baptism? Are they not saved by faith? Because that's what Paul just told us down here. Right? You're saved by faith, not of works. But here the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, you know what? You, you look the part. You know, you're, you're all dressed up in the right way, but you don't seem to be uh, doing the right thing. Well, you seem to be doing the right thing, but you're not doing the right thing. So let's go back to James, and let's just take a look at what James has to say there. Plugging James now into Revelation chapter 3. So James 2... And let's just reread verses 17 to 18. <coughs> I think that's you, Shaping. I'm coming. James 17 to 18. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So here we have the statement, so you can have faith, but without works, it's dead. And he says, show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Faith is demonstrated by works. It is not a theoretical, ethereal sort of quality that is just something that's intellectual. Right? It has to be something that is demonstrated by actions. Now, I'm just going to read you a little section from Eureka. Now, this is page 359. Okay, So this is the, the whole <coughs> argument that Brother Thomas is making here. And it's I found it quite a fascinating argument. He says, Clement, and he's talking about that writer back from the 1st or 2nd century. He says, Clement was talking about the justification of sinners. Right? So in all the passages we just looked at, that was Clement's argument, right? 
He says, but Clement was talking about the justification of sinners, not the justification of saints. Sinners are justified from their past sins in the way stated, so becoming saints. As for saints, faith alone will not save them. Okay? So I just want to stop and think about that. Sinners are justified by faith. Saints are justified by more than this, right? I was going to use his faith, his words, um, by more than faith alone. And that was, I think it was a Martin Luther phrase, faith alone. Um, that became sort of a, a, a hallmark phrase. So he goes on to say, James teaches this clearly. By works a man is justified and not by faith only. He is writing of a man who, like Abraham, had already become a saint. The saints are justified by works, but the saint who seeks to be justified by or to be pronounced worthy by faith alone is like his faith dead. For faith without works is dead. Uh, dead as that of the many that were in Sardis. So this is kind of like the conundrum, right? When James is writing, he's talking about saints. And saints are not justified by faith alone. They've already been baptized. They've been brought into the ecclesial world. But now there is an expectation of action. They've got to put that faith into action. Now think about that. Think about Abraham, right? Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, right? He went out and he believed, right? And he went into the land, right? He gets to the land and then he's asked to do certain things. He's promised that he's going to have a son. And that son is going to fulfill the promises and he's going to become a great nation and so on and so forth. So God says to Abraham, take your son, Isaac, your only son, up to Mount Moriah and slay him. So now Abraham has to put his faith in, do you really believe God? And Abraham would say, well, yeah, I believe God. But if he doesn't act on that belief, then he's dead. Probably to me, the most outstanding um, example of this, like just for a, like a stark example, would be Noah. Right? Now just think about this phrase in James. <coughs> faith without works is dead being alone. It took a lot of work to build the ark. 20 years. But if Noah had believed with all his heart that God was going to set the flood and didn't lift a hammer, he was just as dead as everybody else because his faith was without works and it was dead being alone. Right? So this is what Brother Thomas is talking about here. He's basically saying, look, when we come in from the outside, it's based on our faith that we are justified. Sinners are saved by faith period, but saints, ones who have been sanctified now and cleansed, must go beyond that and put into action their beliefs, like Noah, like Abraham. You can't stop there. And that's where the world, right, it's just like, you know, I'm saved, right? Once saved, always saved. All you got to do is incant those few little words, and you're saved. That's it. And it's over. I remember Brother Paul was talking to us on Sunday at the exhortation that it's the same for the Muslims, right? All you got to do is say, there's one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And that makes you a Muslim. And as he said, well, I guess I'm a Muslim now, right? You know. So, like, if that's it, um, that's very much like the born-again Christian sort of approach, is that you, you say those few words and that's it. You accept Jesus into your heart and it, and it stops there. But it doesn't because James makes this very clear statement that faith without works is dead. And if you want to argue that James had it wrong, well, then you also have to argue that the Lord Jesus Christ had it wrong in Revelation chapter 3, right? Because in Revelation 3, he says, I know you're dead because of your works, because of your actions. So what is, what is a seemingly a conundrum at first, and can kind of, kind of get us a little bit um, tied up in knots, becomes much more easy to understand once you kind of put all the scriptures together. Now look at the antidote to this. If we're in Revelation 3 or close to it, um, 
back in James, maybe Revelation chapter three. It's it's stealing from the next letter, um, but I want you to just look at what's going on here. Uh, Revelation chapter three, verse eighteen. This is the letter to the Laodicean ecclesia, right? So Revelation chapter three, and um, let's just read verse eighteen. Whoever's next, go ahead, mom. Jesus I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness be not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. So Revelation 3, verse 18, we are to buy gold, right, which we've talked about being equated with faith throughout the scriptures, but also you've got to get white raiment. Now, why is he telling them to buy white raiment if they're already clothed in white raiment? Right? Obviously, there's more to it than just baptism. Right? He's counseling them to buy of him white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. The shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Anoint thine eyes with, with eyesile that thou mayest see. So effort is required in order to be clothed. And that's the, the issue here. He says, look, you've got a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So what do you do about that? Well, then you have to go work at it. You have to go get uh, white raiment because he says, last you, you are a naked, right? So you've got to be clothed. So it requires a conscious effort. Come back to Romans chapter 2, just as a cross-reference here. And we looked at this before when we looked at the idea of being clothed with immortality. We went all through Corinthians. Uh, so we're not going to spend the time to do that. Um, just remember that we looked at the idea of you know being clothed upon with a different nature. Right? So that's the concept. But Revelation, or sorry, Romans chapter two and verse seventeen. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Two verse seventeen. I give you the right one. Seven. Sorry, Shen. Revelation two verse Romans two. Verse 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. So you've got this patience, patient <clears throat> continuance in well-doing. What are they doing? They're seeking. So they're pursuing after. They're seeking um, glory, honor, immortality, eternal life which is the equivalent of having a white raiment mm -hmm. when you go back to first corinthians 15 this idea of being clothed upon with immortality so in order to have white raiments we have to seek it we got to put the effort in and he says here by patient continuance in well-doing so pick up this concept here, there's there's well-doing. There has to be the purchasing of white raiment, <coughs> right? There is, there is action that is going on. This is requiring effort on the part of the person that's involved. So if you just come over to, um, to Jude, again, uh, back before Revelation, in verse 3, he's, the same concept here is being talked about. So Jude... In verse 3, Marion, if we can have you read that for us. Second. <clears throat> Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So there you have the earnestly contending for the faith, which down as we read in verses 22 to 23, was equated <coughs> with the idea of garments that were not spotted by the flesh. So it's clean garments when those two ideas are put side by side. So it requires effort on our behalf in order to engage in this. So come over to Revelation 16, just over a couple of pages. 
in verse 15, it kind of ties these things together because this is, again, in context, this is the, I call this the Christadelphian verse, because this is the era in which we live. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. Look, I will come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays alert and does not lose his clothes, so that he will not have to walk around naked and shameful condition be seen. Okay, so here we have the thief like coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told the two things that go side by side here is to watch, which of course has a lot in, in behind it, the idea of watching what's going on and everything he's been telling them, the invitation of Revelation to come and see, and keeping garments. Which, when you go and plug that back into Revelation, chapter 3, right? And what we're looking at the letter to Sardis, he's talking about those that are clothed with garments, right? So watching is associated with keeping garments. So it's not just a case of saying, I fearily, I believe, and that's it. We have to translate that belief into action. It's got to be acted upon, which become works of faith. Now, it's not works of of self-righteousness or works of trying to prove ourselves or boasting or anything like that. It's more along the idea of the work of the activity of the truth um, and as engaging ourselves in those actions. So blessed is he that watches and those who keep their garments, lest, he says, they walk naked and they see a shame. So come back to Revelation chapter 3 and um, let's take a look at the rest of this verse and what he says. Um, when it comes down to uh, the last part of this. So Revelation chapter 3, and let's read together verses um, 3 down to verse 5. Remember therefore what you have received and hold, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their cloth. They will walk with me, dressed in, in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. I will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Okay, thank you very much. So he says here, watch, because I'm going to come as a thief if you're not watching. He says, now, if you've not defiled your garments, right, so it's possible for us to defile our garments, those who have not defiled their garments are rewarded to walk with him, which is Christ, of course, in white. Right? So that's the idea of being changed, right? They're given that opportunity to walk with him in white, for they are worthy. And so that's the, the issue here is they are worthy. So worthiness has to do with not defiling garments, right? So this is the issue here. To be worthy is the idea of not defiling garments, and it's tied to watching, right? Because unless you watch, you're going to have defiled garments, because that's what Revelation 16, 15 told us, right? But here he says, like, if you watch, you won't, he won't come to you as a thief. But you're going to have not defiled your garments, and therefore you're going to walk with Christ in white because you are worthy. And um, that's really the key to this whole thing is, is an active working faith. So not only do you believe, but you are active in your belief. You're, you're putting your beliefs into action, and you're, you're involving yourself with him. And so it says we're going to walk with him in white because we're worthy. So we just want to look at Revelation chapter 1 in verse 13, because this is one of the characteristics of the, of the man of one that we looked at originally um, a year or so ago now. 
Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13. Um, Charlene, you want to read that for us? In the midst of the seven, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the, to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Okay, so he's clothed with a garment down to the foot, right? So that's the one that's having this conversation with John here that comes up from Revelation chapter 1, and it's that symbolic man of one, and he's clothed with a garment right the way down to the foot. And what we're told here is that if we too overcome, then we will walk with him in white. And remember what he said, in uh, it's the letters to John, or well, in, in the Gospel of John, he says, Fear not, I have overcome the world. And all the way through the book of Revelation, he tells us the reward is to him that overcomes. So we have to believe in the power of God to work upon us so that we can, by his strength and by following what he tells us, overcome. It's a preparation process, though. It requires action on our behalf. So come to Revelation 17, or 19, sorry, because here we get the picture of the, the bride, the lamb's wife. And she's been busy, busy, as most brides are, as we can attest to. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. <clears throat> all right, so we notice here, first of all, she has spent some time and she's made herself ready, right? So this is actions that she's taken, but it's granted to her to be arrayed in white linen. And it's clean and white. And we're told it's the righteousness of the saints. Is this whitening a continual process? Or is there more than one whitening taking place? Well, I think it's the whitening thread that goes on throughout our lives, right? Yeah. Because if you think about it, like, you think of a word like verse like Malachi. You know, he's like a fuller's soap right and he shall purify the sons of levi right and you say okay well how does that happen well you read in john 17 sanctify them through thy truth <coughs> thy word is truth we read about it in um in corinthians where the lord or it's either corinthians or ephesians where he says um that uh christ loved the ecclesia gave himself for it washing her with the water of the word right and this is where that washing process has to be engaged in. So this making ourselves ready is constantly washing our minds with the water of the word. Now you can't be pouring clean water in one side and filth in the other and thinking that, you know, that's going to have an effect. It's not. We've got to pour clean in and stop putting the filth in. So we've got to keep ourselves clean and dedicated to our to our God. So the washing process is a continual process that goes on throughout our lives, but it's not an academic one. Mm. It's it's one that requires action. No different than Abraham being promised the land wasn't academic. It wasn't like he got a piece of mail in the paper or a piece of mail paper in the mail that said you won, you know, a piece of land over in Palestine or Canaan, or whatever it was called at the time. And um, and he's like, great, I've got a piece of land over in Canaan. And he could stick it on his wall and tell everybody I'm a landowner. I got the deed. Right? Yeah, I got yeah. it didn't work that way. No. If you want it, you got to go walk through the length, through the breadth, <laughs> and, and to thee will I give it to thy seed. You have to go be a stranger and a sojourner. And that's what it is with the truth. If we want it, then we have to 
Notice what he says there. They walk with Christ in white. If you want to walk with him in the kingdom, you've got to walk with him now. So what he does, or what he did, we have to do, right? We have to have that character that's being operated, or is operating in our lives, and is constantly in action in the things that we do. Without that, we're in serious trouble. The process of whitening. Yeah, it's the process of whitening. So you look at it in family life, in ecclesial life, in your personal life. You run into a problem. You can read the Bible and you say, well, hmm, what should I do in this case? And you think of what Christ did, temptation. You know, turn these stones into bread. Well, I could do that because I have the power. It's not a temptation for me. Um, but he certainly could. But he answers it with scripture. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right? And he talks about, you know, um, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. So that belief had to turn into action. And this is the tragedy in a lot of ways of life and the truth. Is you can find somebody who believes the truth, they they intellectually get it, but when push comes to shove and the time actually comes to okay, now you are challenged, are you going to obey what I told you? <coughs> that we can turn around and do our own thing. And we can push the word out of our minds, sear our conscience with a hot iron, and even though we know this is the way that we're supposed to walk and we don't do it. And the process of the washing is where we learn to do what we're told, right? I mean, you think of that as a child as they grow up, you know, don't touch the stove because it's going to hurt, you know, and they find out pretty quick that dad was right, you know. Well, God lays out throughout the scriptures that don't do these things because they're going to get you into trouble. Where we need one another. Exactly. You know, and that's where I talk about in Jude. Some making a difference, right? Pulling them out of the fire, hating the spotting of the garments of the flesh, and sometimes as interventions. Sometimes we get over our heads and we don't listen to the word of God. So God invokes the public um, revelation yeah. act, is what I call it, is where, you know, what we can't deal with privately, God will, through whatever circumstance, make clear to other people. And at first we think it's terrible, it's actually his mercy. Because he talks about it, some men's sins are known beforehand. And the reason they're known beforehand is so that they can deal with them, because they couldn't deal with it privately. So sometimes we'll hear about some brother who might have been a speaking brother, and everybody knew him and respect him, whatever, and he's gone and done some terrible thing. And, you know, it's come out in the open. And we can say, well, isn't that terrible to come out in the open? Yes, it's terrible that this has happened, but sometimes it's the mercy of God that it's come out in the open, because he has an opportunity now to deal with it, this side of the judgment seat. He couldn't deal with it by himself privately, but now he's forced to deal with it. And again, that involves the rest of us who then have to act in a godly way, you know, and not in a, you know, condescending and self-righteous way. We have to try and help that individual. So that's the process of the washing. It's taking the word into our hearts and our minds and that can only happen if we take it in. So we got to do our readings. We got to get to the classes. We got to get that word of God going into our minds to change our thinking from what we naturally think, loss of the eyes, loss of the flesh, life, pride of life, into what God wants us to be about. And that's the challenge that's being that's been going on. The promise is that if we do that, we will walk with him in white because we're worthy. So come to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We're just referencing this, but this is really what that means. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, and it's verse 49. I'm just going to read a little section, verse 49 down to verse 54, because this really takes Corinthians 15 and puts it, or elevates it to the higher meaning of what's being talked about here. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49 to 54. So we'll just take a couple of five verses each or whatever and read that. I think you're right next going. Okay. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49. Uh, two each or five each? Five each for this five one. Each? Fine, yeah. 
And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. <clears throat> so when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in the victory. Okay, so this idea, we've borne the image of the earthly, we also have to bear the image of the heavenly, we're going to be changed, and he says this corruptible must put on incorruptible, incorruption. And that takes you back to the Zechariah verse we were looking at. Remember where Zechariah talks about Joshua, the high priest, which typifies the Lord Jesus Christ, and he had filthy garments, he had a nature that was defiled, but he was perfect. So even though his nature was not perfect, he was perfect. He never caved into it because constantly he battled the thoughts of the flesh with the word of God. So his garment, his nature was changed, right? He ascended to his father and his corruptible put on in corruption he had to change right so that's what we have to do is we have to change from corruption to incorruption that's the idea of being with dressed in white with him but come over to second corinthians chapter four because in second corinthians chapter four we have a similar idea here but it just kind of um takes this idea a little bit further. Remember he says, we've borne the image of the earthy, so we also will bear the image of the heavenly. Well, let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and Hannah, or Fred, sorry, if you want to read verses uh, 10 to 11. <clears throat> Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for <coughs> Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest, manifested in mortal flesh. Okay, so you get the point there. He says we carry about the dying of Christ in our bodies, but also, he says, the life of Jesus must be manifested in our bodies. So if we want to be made like the image of the heavenly, then we have to first bear the image, right? We have to have that character in us. So we can't say, well, I believe there's going to be a kingdom of God, and I believe that there's going to be uh, changes that are going to take place on the earth. Faith alone is not going to save us, right? It's got to be coupled with works. That belief has to then be put into action, that believing that, I'm going to act. And again, I hearken back to Noah. He could believe all he wanted that there was going to be a flood. If he didn't do anything about it, he's dead. Yes, Joey? Did, did you cover it uh, maybe last class, but is not Sardis the one that was uh, famous in history for falling to Alexander the Great? In that Sardis was inherently fortified. It was a city built on an escarpment. So they had the appearance of watching, being strong, being prosperous. But in action, they, they actually did very little to watch. Yes. So it basically Sorry. gave Cyrus opportunity to come as a thief in the night. Or Cyrus never came, he sent one of his generals. Yeah. And so the city fell. So there's actually a play on the well-known Achilles heel of the city. Yeah, where it's they impregnability. Knew yeah. The army was outside the walls. But they didn't act. Yeah. And the thing is, is that's the smugness, right? That's our nature. Naturally, we can we can think we've got it. 
And right, and Cyrus's army used that to their advantage. Yeah, that there was that smugness that they thought they were uh, indestructible. Invincible. And, and it's interesting because the whole dropping of the helmet routine, right? So here is your defensive outer shell, right? Yeah. And uh, that's what gave it away. It was their trust in their in their own seemingly showy kind of outward appearance. So that was when the centurion, or I guess it wouldn't have been a centurion, but the, the guard at the time dropped his helmet down the wall, climbed down to get it. Yes. And then someone observing from the Persian army. How we got down. Watched him climb back up. And, I think yeah. that was supposed to happen twice on two different occasions. Yeah, it was for certain with the Persians and maybe again with the Romans. I'm not sure. I think though. it was Alexander, wasn't it? Might have been Alexander. I have to double check. Alexander, but you're giving Cyrus is the is the myth anyway, the legend. Yeah. So I think that's the thing. Like you know, you think of the words of Paul: "Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall." Right. And I think that's the to us the last one with Cyrus is if we think that we're doing just fine, we got to take heed lest we fall. We fall to the same problem. And this is the thing: we've got to have the life of Christ manifest in our flesh. The we in this case is Paul and Timothy together. Yeah. That's, that's another nice thing to know. Yeah. The younger being taken along by the elder. So, Josiah, if you want to just read for us, it's still 2 Corinthians 4. Okay. And let's just read verses 2 to 4, just backing up a little bit. But I have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight, in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Thanks. That's good enough. Yeah, that's that's good. So here you have the point that we want to get out of this one is manifestation of the truth, right? He says, look, we've, we, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, right? We're not walking in craftiness, nor handling the God, the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. See, the truth is not merely a set of doctrines that are written down in a statement that's put on a shelf and kept under lock and key, right? It is a set of doctrines, but those doctrines have to be manifested. The Apostle John, in the first letter of John, says that, you know, if we say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So the truth is something that has to be manifested, it has to be shown, and it's also something that has to be done. And that's the issue in Sardis. They've got a name that they're alive, but by their works, they are shown to be wrong, right? They're shown to not be alive, that they're shown to be dead. And so what we have to try and do is make sure that in our activities, we are keeping alive the word of God. It's not just a set of, it's not a creed that we have and that we'll defend to the death like they, they've done over thousands of years, right, and argue about the creed. It's about a set of beliefs that are visibly acted upon and shown in our lives. That's what it has to be, right? It's got to be actions that are taking place in our life. So that's the, uh, that's the, the word of God that we have um, in front of us. And I think the next section we're going we're gonna to begin is, is a little bit longer than the time we've got left tonight, so I think we'll leave it there. But is there any other comments or questions on this concept of, of living the truth um, in this way? Well, I, I was thinking in, in the last passage that you made, um, I was thinking of back in the Old Testament, they bound the law around their arms and their, their mm. suffix. And, and this is what we have to do with the New Testament. We've got to put Christ in. We've got to have Christ in our thoughts. And if we've got Christ in our thoughts, nine times out of ten, I would think is a good, is a good example, we're, we're going to be safe. 
we've got Christ in the mind, then there's hope for us. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Because this is really the, the key to this whole thing of Sardis. The problem with Sardis was they had this name that they're alive, but they're dead, right? As Dad says, you've got to have it in your mind. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So even though I'm, I'm crucified symbolically, which is baptism, which is kind of going back to this whole thing we've been talking about, sinners saved by faith, by grace, right? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, right? So it's the idea of having Jesus Christ live in us. So we are possessed in that sense. You know what I mean? Like in, in the good sense of the word, sure. meaning you're motivated and your actions are guided by our understanding and by our belief in him. So I'll just scribble that one on the bottom. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Um, and that's one of the key issues, is having our actions motivated by his thoughts, right? It's not just by our own thoughts. And that's what makes us alive, as opposed to just having a name that we're alive, but we're actually dead, right? It's got to be alive. Let's just look up the first epistle of John one as well, just to kind of cap this idea off. First epistle of John. Uh, the one we were looking at is 1 John chapter 1, and um, verse um, verse 6 is where we want to start. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? So in that passage in John, you've got some of these concepts tied together quite nicely here. Because you have to do the truth. You don't just believe it. You have to do it. It's, it's an active thing. It's like faithing. Right? Uh, we don't have uh, a, uh, an English equivalent to what is in the Greek, right? To faith something, right? It's, it's to actually believe it and, and do it, to act upon that, uh, as, it, as it was put in the Old Testament. So here he says, we have to do the truth, and you've got to walk in the light as he is in the light. And if we do that, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, or from all sin, sorry. So when you think about that, what are we talking about in Revelation 3? He's talking about those who, there are a few names in Sardis who are not defiled, right? They have not defiled their garments because they are worthy. How are they worthy? Because of their works. And they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. Right. So if you want to walk with him in immortality in the kingdom age, you first have to walk with him in this lifetime by living his actions in your life. And that's this idea that we have in, in the letter to Sardis. So it's very much tied into having the truth actively working in our lives, not just being able to recite the statement of faith and to defend it. Although we need to understand it and we need to have it, but we also have to be able to live what is in it. It's got to be a living document. Truth in the truth. Yeah. Well, this is it. The Word of God is living and active, right? And it's got to be living and active in our lives. If it's just a book on a shelf, it's pointless. There's absolutely no point in looking at it whatsoever. So I think we'll, uh, we'll leave it there.